Hello everybody and welcome to today's uh, use case uh, steering team over the TN. Uh, as usual, the call is recorded and will probably be uploaded on YouTube uh, one or two days. Um, uh, today, first, I want to uh, take a look at the um, ONF Connect CFPs. Uh, thanks for the, to the submissions of uh, some people. Uh, we have now a good few number of talks. I would still like a few other submissions. I try to reach out personally to anybody who I would be interested in seeing or presenting at, uh, at the DTN track. So I would encourage you to submit uh, your proposals uh, to the track itself. Uh, the first deadline is this uh, Friday, so please do them by now. It's not a hard uh, submission, it's just that uh, uh, it's, a few, it's a title and an abstract, it's not a very, not very complicated one. Um, me, uh, I will be on the chair of uh, the, the session and uh, with the help of uh, Ramon and uh, Dominique here, uh, we will evaluate the different uh, talks and track, uh, on the track and um, to provide a very good program for ODTN. Uh, there's also a discussion on the possibility of having uh, ODTM plus TAPI conjunct, uh, conjunct uh, workshop on uh, the Monday of the ONF Connect. Uh, that is yet to be discussed internally within uh, ONF. Um, so yeah, please submit by uh, Friday 31st um, some talks. On a second note, I would like uh, Puneet and Vishnu from Sterlite to present their um, proposal for the uh, modulation integration uh, of uh, OpenConfig uh, into the ONS drivers. Uh, Puneet, if uh, you can, I'll make you presenter and uh, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, sure. Present, present it now. Uh, please share your screen. So you will see my screen, right? Andres? Yes. Yes. Perfectly fine. So today we will gonna talk about uh, uh, like the workflow of the modulation configuration, which we have actually worked out, and uh, and maybe in the later part actually we'll talk about uh, maybe in uh, other calls, like how we need to implement that thing in the ONOS. So I'll actually let uh, Vishnu to take you through this presentation. And uh, I'm just handing over to Vishnu. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So hello, everyone. So in the past weeks, we have done our study about modulation configuration. Uh, what, uh, how we should proceed in terms of configuring this parameter. So modulation depends on many other parameters, obviously. So, and we have identified those parameters to be the bit rate, baud rate, OSNR, bit error rate, and channel spacing. All these parameters will be depending on modulation in one way or the other. So while configuring the modulation, we'll have to take care of all of this. So we'll first see the first parameter bit rate. So uh, for supporting higher bit rates, we'll have to switch for higher order modulation schemes. So this will come with the other dependencies with, with other parameters like baud rates and channel spacing. So from theoretical analysis, we have understood that for 100 G bit rate and less than that, the minimum modulation scheme, which our hardware uh, is supporting is DP QPSD. And for more than 100 G up to 200 G, DP QPSD, 8 QAM and 16 QAM, all three are supported. So another way for increasing the bit rate if we don't change the modulation is the uh, increment of baud rate we'll see about it now so baud rate uh, as baud rates are in, is increasing the optical impairments will become more significant which is not very desirable so for increasing bit rate uh, we can either increase the baud rate or we can switch to a higher modulation scheme so the problem with increasing baud rate is the spectral bit will increase 
and which will result in the requirement of a higher spacing. So this can affect the efficiency of the uh, spectrum. Spectral efficiency can reduce if the spacing increases. So in case of a fixed channel spacing system, we'll have to choose appropriate baud rate and select the according select the modulation scheme accordingly. So this is a uh, analysis of how baud rate uh, and modulation scheme and bit rate is basically dependent. So as you can see, for 100G, when we use DP QPSK at 32 gigawatts, we'll need 50 gigahertz of channel spacing. So as we go higher uh, for 16 quam, 8 quam, so we can say we can see that if we want to have the channel spacing uh, fixed at 50 gigahertz, we'll have to use 45 gigawatts and 32 gigawatts respectively. So just to add one point here, I think uh, uh, so the channel spacing is uh, if we kept the channel spacing fixed to 50 gigahertz, right? So available baud rates are basically being fixed to the modulation schemes. So like the 32 gig baud is basically being uh, used for DPQPSK and the 45 and uh, uh, DPQPSK and DPQAM, 16 QAM, and the 45 gig uh, baud rate are using for DP uh, 8 QAM. So the these two are pretty much tied to each other in the hardware itself. Yes. So if we change the modulation, the hardware will automatically switch to the appropriate baud rate. Any questions here? Okay, then we'll continue. So the next parameter is OSNR. So OSNR basically for error-free demodulation of the signal, it's obvious that we'll have we should have a better OSNR. So OSNR is also basically tied with the modulation scheme. So you can see as we go higher in the modulation schemes, the higher the OSNR required for that uh, particular signal to be demodulated. So next uh, parameter is bit error rate. So bit error rate, OSNR and modulation schemes are tightly coupled. So we observe the OSNR for a fixed bit error rate. So theoretical calculations we have currently I have presented here for uh, one in thousand bit error rate. So for that particular bit error rate, uh, we should have a particular OSNR for a particular modulation scheme so that the signal should be uh, demodulated properly. So the next parameter is channel spacing. So I have already mentioned before, like channel, channel spacing primarily depends on the baud rate. As we increase the baud rate uh, for a particular modulation scheme, fixed modulation scheme, the spectrum will widen and the channel spacing will be required will be more. So I think in this whole uh, analysis uh, part, right, for me, uh, what is actually the outcome is that if we fix the channel spacing to that say 50 gigahertz, right, the so modulation will actually uh, gonna dependent on the bit rate and the baud rate, right? And uh, while uh, looking into that uh, baud rate part, we can't actually change the baud rate uh, separately. It's basically being coupled with uh, uh, the modulation schemes. So certainly we have only few parameters left out while configuring the modulation. That first parameter is like uh, uh, the, we need to look into the bit rate and what bit rate we need to actually manage. Based on that, we need to select the uh, modulation scheme, uh, and, uh, and and we have fixed that. Uh, we thought actually to fix that uh, channel spacing to 50 gigahertz as of now to start up with. And uh, while comparing uh, on 50 gigahertz channel spacing with the with the defined uh, modulation available modulation schemes, these are certain parameters which we need to force uh, check and ensure that it is actually meeting and falling within the limits, like the OSNR, the VR. Uh, VR parameters, right? So this needs to be validated and rechecked with the uh, the threshold value uh, uh, versus the practical value which we are getting it over the line. So yeah, so I think the next part is something related to the workflow, right? What we actually see that how that the workflow should be and look like, right? When we actually fix that uh, uh, spacing to fifty gigahertz. So. So 
first of all we will check for the bit rate and we expect the user to provide the required bit rate uh, for the channel so while we issue the connectivity request itself we'll have to check for the bit rate itself like that i require a particular connection at this bit rate so next we'll check whether the bit rate is less than 100g or if it is more than 100g so if it is less than 100g we'll directly configure dpqpsk to the transponder then we will retrieve the osnr available at the receiver transponder and check it with the threshold value which i have mentioned in the previous slides if the osnr is greater than the threshold then the configuration is fine channel is running fine and we can retain the configuration as we will display a warning if the bit rate is greater than 100g then we can first configure the 16 quam retrieve the osnr and compare it again with the threshold value if the osnr is greater than threshold fine we'll retain the configuration or else we'll switch to a lower moderation scheme because for greater than 100 gb 16 quam and 8 quam are possible so we'll go for the lower modulation scheme and check the osnr again in case the osnr is greater than threshold it is fine we'll retain the configuration or else we'll have to suggest for a uh, suggest the user that you have to reduce the channel bitrate because for more uh, greater than 100 g it is not possible to have a modulation scheme set on the channel so that it can be properly demodulated so this we have considered a fixed channel spacing of 50 yards in case of flexi grid systems we will have to query the oils controller for available channel spacing for the particular frequency configured in the transponder So this is, I think, uh, all about like uh, any inputs like uh, uh, on this whole uh, part. Um, I think it's good. Uh, I actually like the workflow, and I think that starting with a fixed modulation uh, scheme is. Uh, as we have done in uh, you know ETN for now, it's uh, it's perfectly fine. Uh, so I I approve that. Uh, I like the workflow, as I was saying. Uh, let me get back to the screen. Uh, I like the workflow. Uh, now it's a matter of uh, taking into the almost implementation and um, putting it into details. Um, anybody else has any comments? Uh, I got a comment. Uh, I, I like the workflow as well. I think that makes. Uh, good sense for a fixed 50 gigahertz environment um just a word of caution that for a flex code environment i think the decision making may be different depending upon the filtering penalty that would be seen uh, through the path because the the wider aqam may see uh, a much greater filter penalty which in some instances can result in the 16 qam actually operating better than the 8 qam but i think if the if we're operating within a fixed 50 gigahertz environment i think the decision making there makes perfect sense yeah right kevin yeah so i think uh, here we need to uh, that the dependency what we have in this case is basically we need to query to ols that whether that uh, uh, particular wavelength, wavelength uh, particular channel spacing is available for that frequency or not okay okay yeah so uh, but do you i think uh, so and do you know uh, the, can you just actually uh, share that uh, whether that uh, in the tapi whether it, it is uh, in plan that how, can we query that to ols and ask that uh, that whether the frequency and that uh, the selected frequency is actually having what channel spacing uh, in the in the optical spectrum. Um, so good question. Uh, I would uh, turn it to uh, Lyndon, who's in the call from the Tapi Group. Um, can we opt, uh, can we learn that uh, that parameter related to modulation from the open line system uh, through Tapi? Uh, Lyndon, is there anything like that? Uh, Lyndon, you're muted if you're trying to speak. Uh, 
Okay. Um, okay, let me put it as an action point here uh, for myself and you guys. Um, make sure Tabby supports this use case. Uh, we can follow up with uh, Kartik uh, on uh, via email. Uh, I'll start that thread. Uh, one thing that I would ask you guys uh, is for you to share the slides so we can uh, upload them and refer to them. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think uh, the next step is uh, to create some... Uh, so I think we should start at the lower level, which is the drivers. So I think uh, the first element should be taking care of uh, what parameter we would go about and configure in the open config from the open config model, and then create a behavior to do that in uh, in ours. Uh, make sense? Yes, makes sense. I think, uh, and one point I think which we for, which we are, which is needs to be uh, it's good actually you highlighted this point. So the support what we require in the modulation part of it uh, from the hardware side, uh, the first part is basically it is supporting the tapi. A tie and uh, for this tie, then open config, and then mm -hmm. certainly the device behavior and uh, and and the tappy side of it, right? So, so and be understood uh, like on the. So what I would start with is take a look at uh, how open config uh, does the few things that uh, you guys need, and at the same time we can also discuss with the tappy group, um, the the tappy group and the tie group, both of them. Uh, but uh, I know that uh, it's uh, important for the uh, people at the Thai level and the Oculus level to understand how we prefer to tune it uh, from an open config perspective. So I would start from there, uh, take a look at the open config models and uh, check whether, uh, check how the open config model uh, you can read and you can write that parameter that uh, you care about and make a proposal for that. Uh, so we can add it in Onus, and we can tell uh, Oculus and then Tai uh, this is how we we see it in the model, uh, adhere to it. Um, and uh, for Tapi, I'll follow up with uh, that uh, uh, that email thread I was talking about. Okay, here is. Uh, All right. Yeah, uh, I think if you guys uh, can an update next week would be would be great on at least uh, not the Java classes but the uh, the Open Config models. It uh, would be good to have next week. Sure, I think we'll discuss that piece maybe on next or next week. Okay, uh, does um, does this uh, workflow is this workflow okay for everybody? Uh, any any comments? From uh, like transponder, uh, from Nokia, from Adva, anybody uh, else has any comments on this? Is something that is uh, achievable on uh, your hardware? Sorry, I may have a very naive uh, question here. Uh, it's concerning um, on the discovery on the possible. Uh, uh, modulation format available because uh, uh, I think different transponders have different uh, capabilities and my uh, my question that is maybe not directly uh, related to the workflow uh, configuration of uh, modulation format configuration is how um, uh, the things are going to be uh, discovered uh, from um, from Onos and uh, reported maybe to to uh, an orchestrator on top. It may be uh, um, something that we may think in, in the in the future. It's my comment, I should say. More about um, the question, the question. Yeah, so that's uh, that's I think part of that uh, look at the open config models that uh, I was suggesting. Um, I believe uh, that is done. I was taking a look rapidly at this like a few weeks back, and I think it's done through uh, basically a leaf that contains a vendor-defined implementation. Basically, you have to agree, the controller and the device has to agree on what they exchange in there, uh, because it's vendor-specific. 
So what I would think that we could do is basically create a behavior uh, that enables discovery of that parameter uh, on a vendor specific case. And we will show an example of uh, how we think it's doable and then we can implement it in different ways. Um, and that's for discovery and the same goes for deployment. We store that information either in the device annotation, either in the port annotation uh, somewhere. Uh, we discussed that uh, in the implementation details. And then when, when time comes for provisioning, we take that information and, uh, and send it down uh, based on the computation that we need and the visual compared. And uh, the same information then gets deployed up. Uh, to me, this is very similar to the power that uh, we started working with some time ago from a learning perspective. We have a power config behavior that enables us to learn about the power on a certain device and then expose it to the rest of ORMS. Make sense to me? Yes, definitely. Uh, I, I think you're right, Andrea. So um, uh, you can have a look on the operational mode in open config. Okay. That way, yeah. Yeah, in the uh, you know the terminal device uh, models. Yeah, you can find the the op operation. Okay. Uh, thanks for that one. Uh, so yeah, uh, that that was the I, I didn't remember the exact parameter name, but that now that you mentioned it, this is precisely what I was looking at, and this is vendor defined. I think this is related to modes of operation parameter, right? Uh, sorry, uh, Puneet, come again. I think it is related to modes of operation parameter. Uh, different modes of operation, right? I think so. So we'll look into this and then not problem at uh, uh, that. Okay. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Andrew, we're gonna able to hear us, right? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, I'm saying actually uh, in the leaf uh, uh, open uh -huh. config model, right? It is actually mentioned in uh, modes of operation uh, mm -hmm. details, right? right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, right, right, that's right. So you can see the container uh, operational yeah. modes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I think this is where we uh, would need to uh, implement a behavior to retrieve that container, and uh, then every implementation of that behavior would. Uh, uh, be capable of parsing what the device returns. Uh, I mean, as, as Dominique said, it's vendor specific, so a vendor would do something and some other vendor would do something else. But uh, we would uh, show an example with, uh, let's say, the Cassini device and we would agree on the, that, or even the Nokia device, and uh, you guys could implement uh, that. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Conrad, I saw that you unmuted. Um, sorry to cut you off. No, 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 it's not an issue. So you are, were asking about uh, about the questions and comments. Probably uh, we need to sync up with our hardware guys about those. <coughs> Uh, about the scenarios and, and then probably uh, we can say more. Okay, uh, thanks, that would be great. Uh, let's take, a, uh, I would say to take it offline and then uh, report back to us in the next few meetings. Uh, you can take the slides that uh, Pramit will send to me and make sure to upload them and share them with uh, the mailing list in order that for everybody to okay. have them and uh, take a look. Okay, thank you. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay, uh, great. That was a uh, very, good, very good discussion. Thanks, everybody, for that. Uh, I think the next step is, again, to take a look at deeper at the open config and propose a behavior implementation, and we would uh, come up with uh, some more details uh, on the next call. Okay. 
So on the GMPY side, uh, remember everybody we talked about the integration of uh, this PCE uh, with Enoros uh, to ensure better parameter handling and uh, better um, optical impairment validation. Uh, I had a call today with uh, the people from uh, Orange uh, that are in the GMPY team. Uh, and um, basically they told me that they have that uh, REST API that we could leverage to ask for this uh, optimal path across the network that uh, we provision uh, and that we control and that uh, GMPI is aware of. So uh, I think that's a very good first, uh, first step. And they also have an implementation. Uh, uh, I had a question. Uh, sure. So, uh, what is the uh, the the interface um, uh, that you mentioned from Orange? It is the is it uh, tapi, uh, this is tap tapi based interface. Um, uh, no, no, that? it's it's they have a very uh, uh, they have their own Yang model. Uh, the call ended just before this one started, so I did not have time to take a look into that Yang model nor into that uh, REST API in itself. I just know that uh, they have it, so which is a good first step. I mean, it's not something that we will have be, to be created. Uh, it's just a matter of integrating it with the proper, uh, the proper use case um, and the proper set of classes. Uh, the, um, so I think that the next step there is to have a call with uh, the GMPI team, uh, comprised of also uh, Kevin and Birch from Juniper and Victoria from Protective Repertory, to understand really now that we have this piece, uh, what are the next steps that uh, we have to make. Um, this is also supported by the fact that uh, we're starting a very good collaboration with, uh, with Juniper. Uh, thanks to Kevin, Gert, and uh, Domenico and their colleagues. And uh, we are looking at possibly using this as one of the uh, uh, work elements to do together. So that's just an update on, on GNPy for everybody. Uh, any thoughts, any questions? I, uh, in March um, at OLC, so uh, Deep announced uh, GNPy uh, community and the, uh, the um, uh, so they, they are going to uh, he made the tapi in uh, in a GNPY, right? Um, so AK Ono should uh, support a uh, tapi on the right for the interaction with the NPY. Uh, that is that is an option. Uh, the thing is that I don't think this REST API is com uh, compatible with uh, tapi, so we would have to. Uh, discuss with them if uh, they can port top their interface to Tapi, or we would have to build a custom integration. Uh, I think it's a little bit too early in the discussion to have this uh, defined. Uh, I still have not yet looked at that REST API, and I still not have, I still don't know how hard it is to integrate with it or port it to Tapi. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe Kevin has some comments. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm afraid I don't know this. Uh, I focus on the photons uh, and less on the interface, so I'm afraid I can't help you. That's perfectly fine. Uh, I'll take a look myself and uh, share it with the rest of the team. If, if, uh, yes, I think uh, uh, this is uh, we are we are tackling an important uh, discussion point, and uh, uh, Quan I think raised also uh, an, an important uh, uh, concern between the interface between GNPY as an SDN application interface to with uh, uh, with Onos, and which is a data model that is going to be used. I think it will be great to have. Uh, uh, at least uh, some uh, sync up because I understood that uh, there are this uh, liaison between uh, uh, tip and uh, uh, yes, tip uh, and uh, tapi as far as I understood. But I think what we should be um, uh, concerned is about the data model that is going to be used. I have some feedbacks on what Orange is is um, 
is, is using, they, they have also uh, uh, their uh, young model. I would like to understand how the community is moving uh, forward because I think we should find uh, a convergence in that uh, in that way. And I think TAPI will be certainly uh, the, the basis. So the point is that TAPI is missing some physical parameters to be exposed as far as understood. And uh, we need to also to understand from Kartik and the working group uh, on TAPI, how uh, the TAPI, uh, the topology model is going to evolve of the path computation uh, model, are going to evolve to integrate those uh, parameters required by uh, GNPY. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I'll, so what I'll do as next step, I'll take uh, an action item myself and take a look at that REST API and maybe report better next time on uh, what that REST API is. So we can have a further discussion on what's the, the correct way of using it or uh, integrating it with TAPI or stuff like that. Just a quick comment. This is Stefan here from, from, from ATFA. I just want to say that I'm 100% uh, supporting what just has been said. Uh, we need to converge uh, to, uh, to some, some common uh, APIs. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm aware of the, the discussion in, in the tip group, yeah. And uh, I'm also 100% supporting uh, the idea of avoiding some uh, uh, additional or different interfaces for achieving that uh, integration. <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm, f I'm fully aware that uh, for let's say full multi-vendor OLS interoperability, we will need a tool. Uh, like uh, GMPy, um, and uh, of course we need then also s also the parameters, some key parameters of the optical amplifiers or so in that tool, completely understood. Uh, but I also would 100% uh, support. Yeah, if we could achieve that through TAPI, that would be perfect uh, because then we wouldn't we could avoid, like I said, yeah, uh, that uh, some some other uh, interfaces would have to be. Uh, used for this specific functionality. So just so, uh, that you know that I'm supporting that as well. Uh, yeah, great. That, I think I think it's a very good point. It's just that uh, and there needs to be a discussion also with the GNPY team. So I'll bring it up with them and see what they say. Uh, I think uh, I'll, I think it's, it's best that uh, we start taking a look at what they have and see how far it matches with, uh, with TAPI itself. Uh, also because there are two sides to this discussion. One side is uh, the topology information provisioning that, that GMPY needs, uh, which contains a lot of information which I don't think TAPI supports fully. And the second one is the connectivity service uh, request of TAPI that could be used to ask uh, the, the, the path computation engine and path computation APIs in GMPY to compute the path. So uh, I think that there are two sides of this. Uh, the easier side is probably uh, the, the request uh, for A to B path computation, because that's a connectivity service and it's fairly simple to implement, uh, as we have seen in ONS uh, for the northbound, um, while instead like exposing all the parameters might be a, a little bit more complicated because we will need to extend the TAPI itself to expose those parameters. But, uh, having said that, uh, I'll, I'll take a look at the REST API. Um, I encourage everybody to do it too. Uh, I think so. It's it's on the upstream, uh, at least as Orange told me. It's on the upstream, on but different branch. So it's not in the master. If you go in the GMPY uh, repo. Uh, it's an upstream GMPY repo, but in a different branch, uh, slash pull request. It's some, some, somewhere there uh, because it's not merged to the master yet. So if anybody wants to take a look at that, I think that not being in the master, we still have a lot of time to, to tweak that. Uh, but I will also schedule a call with the GMPY team to learn more about it and pull everybody together and see what their ideas are on this, okay? Yes, and I have an additional comment. That's great to 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 discuss this point, and I fully 
fully support also what I've heard before. Uh, is Orange willing to um, be involved in um, in Auditien? Uh, that is a very good question. <laughs> uh, I know that they are pushing a lot for the transfer PCE component uh, that uh, they they have done on top of uh, Open Daylight. And, and they are also more a lot focused on the Rodium scenario, which is uh, not what our open line system based uh, uh, deployment. So uh, I think they are interested in this specific component for the um, for GMPY. I mean, they are always interested in extending and making GMPY better because they use it in their transport PCE uh, project. But I don't know if they will be, in, I don't think, actually, that they will be interested in contributing to Onos itself. So it will be more of a contribution to GMPY. Let's say we are beyond TAPI, they could contribute to TAPI on top of GMPY, but they will not. So they will be an indirect, in, in the indirect contribution to ODTN, if that makes any sense, Tom. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting, and uh, I think... Um... Uh, yes, it's uh, it may be a, a point that you may raise the, from Orange, for, to Orange, I should say, and their willingness to um, to contribute on the interface based on TAPI, uh, and uh, why not? Uh, it will be beneficial for any project, including Auditian and maybe over uh, Open Daylight Transport PC project, as you indicated. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other thoughts? Any other comments? Okay, then if not, I'll uh, switch gears and I'll move to the um, uh, Jira tickets that we have. Uh, so thanks to uh, give an update because nor Buya nor Alessio joined the call, so I'll, I'll give an update. I know both of, both of their work. So um, thanks to Alessio, we now have the capability of providing a, a bidirectional intent on different boards. So before, our bidirectional intent, intent was expressed on the same port. Uh, but as we well know, the many optical equipment has a receiving and transmitting port. So now we have this knowledge and concept of a pair port, which enables you to basically say, uh, okay, this port is transmission only in this direction. And uh, uh, is pair port, which is let's say port one is transmission, port two is receiving, is the port you should use for the bidirectional intent. So if we set up an, um, an intent from point A to point B, we use port one from A to B and port two from B to A. So we have now this capability and it was integrated, for example, in the Lumentum uh, Rodent devices that have this uh, support, uh, but it's uh, integrated in the optical connectivity intent compiler, which means that everybody can leverage it by just providing that uh, uh, pair port uh, flag uh, within uh, their drivers uh, and the port annotation. Um, so I think that's that's very good work and enables us to extend further our capability to, the, to work on, uh, on different optical equipment. Uh, and that was uh, 7976, uh, this one. Um, on 7974, uh, basically that has to do that we have an app that uh, we have not used yet because uh, I thought it would have been specific for transponders, sorry, for rodents, but because it's called the Open Rodum app, but it's actually an app that showcases on the Onus UI um, a set of parameters and ports from uh, like more detailed ports and parameters related to optical for the device, any device ports. Uh, and it was just a matter of uh, doing a few tweaks to be capable of showing also terminal devices, meaning transponders, on that uh, uh, on that UI. Um, so Alessio did that. It was just a, a small tweak. And we are now capable of seeing also the ports from terminal devices. And Buyan is working on showcasing also the power. I'll talk about that more later. Uh, I, I hope that Alessio would could join us to do a small demo of that, but uh, unfortunately he couldn't. And same thing, again, uh, based on these two, 7948 was the extension of the Lumentum Rodent drivers with that pair port capability. Uh, but again, it's not just for the 
for the rotors, it can be used for any specific port in any optical device. Okay. So about the power, um, uh, Buyan is also working on the integration. 7947 is an integration of uh, drivers and behaviors for power configuration. In order to be capable of uh, configuring the power on the device uh, through OpenConfig, we, we have that, it's working, it's just a matter of merging it in Autos, and also showcasing it uh, uh, in uh, that application I was talking about and also having a CLI command to, to do so. So that's that's pretty good work that, uh, that Buyan is doing. Um, again, uh, I also know that uh, Ramon is working on upstreaming the Metro Hall open road into the two drivers that they have over there. Uh, just uh, they're focused on that work. So it's, uh, it's there, it's, they, are, they plan to upstream open source. Uh, 7979 and um, 7979 and 7978 are for this uh, work that Sterlite is doing on the modulation that we heard about before. Uh, 7989 uh, is that uh, uh, power that uh, we are working on uh, for the uh, visualization. And I know also Suraj from Fujitsu is still continuing, uh, uh, although on some spare time and not as a full time job, uh, he's uh, drivers for the GDMI. Uh, Fujitsu equipment and also for the netconf for the same for the same device. Um, on a to-do list, Alessio has to move the Lumentum drivers to a device connection cache, which is replicated and it's not gonna fail if uh, the own assistance uh, fails on itself. Any questions? Okay. Um, okay, that's good. Okay, uh, if there is anybody on the TAPI team that can give us an update on uh, the status of TAPI 2.2 and 2.1.2, uh, that would be appreciated. Uh, if not, I'll just go, go forward. Uh, Lyndon, can you give us an update? Well, just very high level, uh, 2.2 release candidate 2, I think, has been posted now. And 2.1.2, there was a bug fix, I think, that was run. Uh, I'm not really familiar with the details of it, but um, I think 2.2 uh, seems to be uh, seems to be on track as far as its schedule is concerned. Uh, thanks, Lyndon. Okay. I still have to uh, send an update uh, uh, for the ONF Connect demo. Uh, I give some thought uh, to the demo itself, uh, and I would like to have uh, functionality freeze by July 30. Exactly what that functionality is, I think, needs, still needs to be discussed. Uh, I'd uh, probably uh, like to have a call with anybody involved, but I'll need to send an email, um, especially for that, because I want to keep it separate from the use case team, because that's uh, it's a milestone that's uh, separate from the deployment that uh, we have, uh, what we're talking about here. And it's, it talks about integration testing and all that. So I'll, I'll have a separate call for that uh, in order to set it up. Uh, with uh, all the parties involved, and I want to make sure also Arturo and uh, the people from NTT participate because they're also interested. And this is not a great time for uh, Asia, obviously. Okay, the power config. As I said, uh, we start working on it. Uh, there's a few other things that needs to be done in the intensive system to provide for it, uh, but uh, we're working on it, and uh, Buyan is going to put some work in there too. Uh, as, a next, as a next generation config update from uh, from models, we're pursuing, we're going far, fairly uh, high space with that, and uh, it's going along well. I think it's uh, still a far ways along, uh, still far far away from anything that we could actually uh, use in production. But uh, for the for the month that uh, we actually started the code base. Uh, 
uh, since a month now. It's it's pretty pretty good. So I encourage everybody to take a look at that tomorrow at uh, uh, six p.m. Uh, Central European time, nine a.m. Pacific Standard. We're gonna have a uh, um, uh, technical steering team from all of us to to discuss it and to check what uh, what the progress is. Uh, I encourage everybody to, to tune in there if uh, you guys are interested. And uh, uh, this is really what the CS 2.0 was thought to be. So I, I encourage everybody to take a look at that. Uh, and uh, I know many of uh, the devices here speak mostly uh, NetConf or REST, RESTConf. And the soundboard for that is currently GMI, but uh, uh, it's, we already discussed the need to, for us to create adapters from GNMI to uh, other type of protocols, which is uh, what we'll probably end up doing for at least NetConf and the rest, uh, in order for us to be able to leverage the potential of this new subsystem, still using it on uh, NetConf and REST devices uh, that would be more akin to the deployment of uh, ODTN. Okay, any questions? Okay, then uh, if not, uh, I think we have our action points for the week. I'll send out the slides. Uh, if anybody could uh, talk internally about uh, the stuff that we discussed, uh, I'll try to stop the GNPI meeting as soon as possible, and uh, I'll make or or I'll make sure the GNPI people join this call at least once to uh, discuss that, and uh, we'll keep everybody updated. Uh, thanks a lot. Take care. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you, Andre and all. Okay. okay bye -bye. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.